Vintage Guitar people, welcome to Have Guitar Will Travel, presented by Vintage Guitar Magazine, with your host, me, James Patrick Regan, otherwise known as Jimmy from the Deadlies, and today I'm speaking with singer, bassist, guitarist, Chris Ballou, from the Presidents of the United States of America, and he also performs as Casper Baby Pants. In our conversation, he covers growing up in Seattle with his mom's classical influences and his father's country influences, and his mom going into the pit at his early shows. Chris takes us through his musical journey, high school in Seattle, college in New York, and busking in Boston, and then back to Seattle to start the Presidents. Chris takes us through his gear, harmonies, silver tones, all set up untraditionally with between two and four strings, and Chris tells us about his President's rig, which was an Epiphone SG style with just two strings tuned to C sharp and G sharp. Chris tells us a little bit about his musical contemporaries in the Seattle area, as well as New York and Boston. And Chris takes us through his other musical projects, the music he created for music libraries, Casper Baby Pants, and his solo Space Pop album. To find out all you want to know about Chris, you can check out his website, chrisballew.org. That's C-H-R-I-S-B-A-L-L-E-W dot O-R-G. And the website for Casper Baby Pants is babypantsmusic.com. That's B-A-B-Y-P-A-N-T-S-M-U-S-I-C dot com. Please subscribe, like, comment, share, and most of all, review this podcast. I'd really appreciate it. And please support Vintage Guitar Magazine and all the wonderful things they do for us guitar players. Because they do so many wonderful things for us guitar players. Here's my buddy Chris. Hey there, Chris. How are you? Oh, hey. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing, you know, pretty good, considering. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Do your streams come up? Like during an election cycle? Do my do my what? The streams, like on on Spotify. Oh, streams! Oh boy, I have no idea. I've never checked. I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I don't know. Yeah, that's a that's a data point I'm not aware of. <laughs> Did you grow yeah. up in uh, Seattle, the Seattle area? Yeah, I grew up well across the uh, lake. So there's Bellevue and there's Lake Washington and then Seattle. And I grew up in Bellevue. Okay. Uh, so, you know, eternally frustrated as a teenager with my parents for not living on the Seattle side of the lake. Um, (laughs) There's nothing going on when I was growing up. But actually, probably because there was nothing going on, I played music all day. So that kind of worked out. Exactly. Exactly. Were your parents musical? Yeah. My dad was into country music. Uh And his definition of country music is if it has drums, it's not country music. Oh, really? Wow. It was real old school country and then my mom was a classical music fan uh-huh. so i got this weird mix from them of country and classical and yeah. i used to go to the symphony with my mom and and uh we'd sit way up in the balcony and i'd i'd be a little kid at the symphony late at night and i'd just get enveloped by the music and just fall asleep and that was to, to this day that's kind of my favorite my favorite thing to do at a great show is fall asleep <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to my mom taking me to the symphony when I was 10 years old. Sure. Yeah. Uh, And did you get to see many country acts for your dad? No, actually, no, because, uh, I I don't know, he he wasn't really overt with his country music fandom until I became a successful musician, and then we started kind of sharing that. Uh Toward the end of his life, though, I did manage to take him out to see some live uh, good old, you know, like hillbilly roots music uh, sure. in Seattle. Okay. So we, not until toward the end of his life did we actually step out and see music together. Okay, all right. But he came to he came to see my band a few times. My mom was at every president's show. Really, right, right in the pit, just getting getting <laughs> knocked about. And you know, she's. I think at that time she was seventy two, seventy three, and she was just right in the thick of it. Wow, it was it was kind of distracting. I'd be up there playing, and I'd see like her getting buffeted around. I'd be like, "Oh, mom, don't <laughs> don't break your bones, yeah, mom." Exactly. How how are your knees? I, you did a lot of jumping. Yeah, I did a lot of jumping. They're okay. They're okay. Uh, it's funny you ask because to continue the mom and dad connection, my dad had terrible knees growing up. I was always like, "Dad's knees, dad's knees," and I'm hoping that I uh, don't um, follow in his footsteps. But yeah, so far. So good, knock on knee. Yeah, very good. Uh, were you playing music in high school and stuff? Yeah, a little bit. Let's see. I, I, my very first band I started, I think I was 16, and it was a really weird band. And um, I wouldn't even call it a band, really. We'd never played live, and <clears throat> it was a very odd lineup. But um, 
so yeah, it, I started at about 16 and then I had a good friend, this guy, Dale Pizer, and he and I became a duo and we, we, then we started really writing songs. We played a few shows and stuff like that, but it was very casual and, and in retrospect, very embarrassing when I listen to those recordings. I'm like singing with a fake English accent and playing my synthesizers and, you know, it's the eighties. Yeah. I'm fully, I'm fully trying to swim in the new, ro- new romantic waters uh-huh. with my stupid accent and my, my, uh, you know, monophonic synthesizers. <laughs> yeah, right on. But what about in high school? Did you play in like a band in high school? Well, that was during high school. That duo uh-huh. was high school. Um, that was the main thing I did was that duo with my friend Dale. Uh-huh. Uh, so yeah, that was the, uh, you know didn't really do any live shows. I think we played it like a, you know, uh, um, kind of an open mic talent show kind of thing at our school. Yeah. And that was about the extent of it. So. <laughs> um, and was your instrument keyboards at the time or did you play guitar as well? Yeah, I was keyboards and drum machines and I had all the MIDI cables and all that, you know, the cutting edge at the time. Uh-huh. Um, and, I, and Dale was guitar and bass. He would okay. play bass in some songs, guitar and others. Um, but I had picked up a guitar when I was about 12 or 13. I had been taking piano lessons from the time I was four until I discovered electric guitar. And my dad had an acoustic guitar, and I remember kind of getting that together and figuring out chords on my own, uh-huh. not looking at a book, but just kind of, oh, that sounds good. That yeah. sounds good. That's good. <laughs> um, but then I got an electric guitar, a, a Hondo, <laughs> a real off market. Sure. Yeah, it was a Hondo um, Telecaster kind okay. of. And uh, in retrospect, it sounded really good. But even in the, my early days, I took strings off. You know, I in the presidents, I played a two string, and our guitar player played a three string. Yeah. But even when I first got the guitar, I realized if I took the low, I couldn't really do bar chords. I, in fact, I still can't do a traditional bar chord because. I just, for some reason, couldn't get it to work, and I was impatient. Yeah. But I took the low E string off, and then I could just do a sort of a bar chord, you know, playing an open A yeah. kind of thing. Um, so even from an early uh, experience with guitar, I was modifying and, you know, trying to short circuit the long arc of uh, technique. <laughs> exactly. Well, and by very Keith Richards of you to take off the E string. Yeah, and I had no idea at the time that that was related to what he he's done. In fact, you know what? I've never played around with that tuning since. Uh, and I, my brother, Tim, who's younger than me, he's a songwriter too, and he just uh, strung up one of his guitars that Keith Richards... Uh, it's an open G, right? Yeah, is what, yeah. 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 And he's texting me like, this is changing everything and revolutionary. you got to do it. Anyway... Well, I, I need to sit down and uh, string something up. <laughs> how how did you develop your bass style, like with the two strings and and? Uh... Yeah, that was a direct inspiration from this guy Mark Sandman. He was uh, he's passed away unfortunately in the 1999. But in the 90s, I became friends with him in Boston in the early 90s, and um, he played a two string slide bass. Uh, tuned to A. It was A A E, and uh-huh. he played slides. So he raised the strings way up off the fretboard. Um, <clears throat> I was hanging out with him one day, and he had a guitar in his uh, studio that he had set up not to play with a slide, but to be able to finger as a two string. Yeah. It, actually, it's this guitar right here, this red oh, wow. one. I think I got the, for some I've got the. Is uh, that an airline, maybe? I think it's a. Supro. I don't think it's an airline. Okay. Anyway, yeah, this guy was set up as a two-string. It's set up as a six-string right now. But um, I picked it up and just went, oh, oh, that's it. That's what I've been looking for. I, at the time, I was playing a student model classical guitar, like a three-quarter scale with four strings on it, just because I had broken strings and I didn't have any money to buy more okay. strings. So I had reduced it to four, had a little contact mic on it, and put it through a distortion pedal and through a bass amp, and that's what I was doing. Uh, yeah, and I picked that guitar up and just went, oh, this is it, too, is the way to go. It just feels so good. And <clears throat> I discovered real quickly that, um, you know, as a songwriter, I definitely grab DNA from different genres and different bands. I'm a big fan of songs. I don't care about genres. Mm-hmm. 
So I was picking, you know, little pieces from, um, you know, wearing my influences on my sleeve, basically. But the two string made it so that when I did that, it sounded new and fresh because the fingering was limited, the harmonics were limited. Sure. Um, yeah, it just it 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 made it so I could own those sort of sampling yeah. ex- exercises and make them my own and grow my own kind of song out of the like DNA of my influences. Uh-huh. It was it was a cool kind of license to do that and sound fresh. Yeah, yeah. And were you the strings? What were they tuned to? Did you did you change tunings at times, or or how did that? Well, work? Mark and I got a he had a big box of loose strings and a caliper. Uh-huh. So we just we started experimenting because we were trying to figure out like what fits my voice, what is the right tension. Wow. You know, there's the issue of like if you get too big and thick with the string and it's a guitar, if you get a bass string on a guitar, there's a lot of fr- uh, fret noise to sure. deal with. Yeah. So it was this really like experimental day with that I remember that one time where we figured it out. Now, I didn't own a tuner at the time. I had no idea. I wasn't in a band either, really. I was just kind of floating around in Boston uh, when I met Mark. And um, so I didn't know what key I was in. And it wasn't until I moved back to Seattle... And, and then Dave Dieterer joined me to be a duo, and he played three-string and I played two-string. Then we kind of had to tune. We figured out that we were in C-sharp, oh, wow. which, which ended up being kind of prophetic as far as how we fit into the sort of arc of Seattle uh, music because a lot of the grunge bands were detuned down to D. Yeah, yeah. But some of them detuned, like Soundgarden, would go down to C-sharp. Sure, sure. So that feel of like C sharp being, you know, um, sort of your baseline, literally. Uh-huh. Uh, it, I think for some weird reason, it sort of helped our um, popularity or something. It helped us kind of feel relevant, maybe, in okay. that world. Yeah. Even though we were very different stylistically and lyrically and everything, but there was that commonality of like a detuned. Uh, guitar that kind of uh, made us dovetail in with the the crest of the wave of grunge. <laughs> sure, <laughs> sure. And, and yeah. as you mentioned Boston a couple times, how'd you end up in Boston? Oh, I went to well, I grew up in Seattle, but then I wanted to experience the East Coast for uh, college, and I found a great school called SUNY Purchase, State University of New York at Purchase. It was super affordable, um, incredible uh, uh, teachers. Great school. Um, so I went there for four years, and at the very end of that experience, there was a visiting artist teaching a class, and he said to the class, if anybody wants a job and you want to move to Boston, I need people to build models. He did these large-scale architectural sound installation things. So me and the drummer in my band uh, in college <clears throat> just moved to Boston and worked for this guy. Uh-huh. And then the bass player, Dale, who was my old high school buddy he yeah. followed okay and so uh you know i just picked boston because this guy offered anybody in the room a job <laughs> yeah, exactly what was your major in in school in college i got a bachelor of fine arts so i okay. went to suny is an art um suny is a uh, great art school um m- you know music theater dance uh visual arts humanities it was great uh-huh. so yeah bachelor <laughs> and- and and the fine art that you were practicing at the time, what was that? Not nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I had no ideas. I had no voice. I had no purpose. I had a great um, advisor because everyone around me in the visual arts department was, you know, very early, even freshman, sophomore year, they were like, I'm a litho- I do lithographs or I paint or yeah. I do metal sculpture. And I was like, I don't know. I do everything because, and nothing to completion. <laughs> <laughs> and my advisor was kind of cool. He was like, Duh, don't worry about it. Just I'll, I'll you know, t- I'll tell everybody on the, or I'll, you know, uh, make sure you graduate or whatever. But yeah, I would just melt metal or like do uh, paintings of, nothing in particular (laughs) it was really i was there to play music i was playing music but i didn't want to go to music school i didn't want to learn theory i just had this gut feeling like i wanted to sort of hunt and peck for my own unique approach and i just wanted to do trial and error so i kind of went to art school as a default um but i i actually in the last five or six years a couple times i've um been inspired and i've done a whole 
arc of visual art that I've had shows and right on. it's all up on my website, chrisbalu.org, if you want to check it out. Yeah. So yeah, every every so often the visual art um, bug comes back and bites me, but um, and I do my own these days. This music I'm doing currently, I do my own album covers and okay. stuff like that. So. Yeah, right on. The before we get into Casper, while you were in New York and then in Boston, were were was there anything musically inspiring you in those areas, like the Boston bands, uh, New York bands? Yeah, there was um, a band called, well, Morphine, first of all. Mark Sandman's band was incredibly inspiring sure. and, and great friends. So that was really cool. And Mark was really like this like hub on a wheel of musicians. There were always people coming in and out of his studio. He was forming and unforming bands. And we had a band together called Supergroup where we would make up songs okay. live on stage. I played that instrument okay. as a two and mark played a three string slide with all sorts of delay on it and yeah, shit and crazy. it was really cool um but there was another experience i had with um so there's the band dinosaur jr sure and the bass player lou barlow <clears throat> he had a band called uh well it's been called different things it was called centrado then it was called sebado um and his style was incredibly influential i mean it was he was weirdly playing exactly the little three-quarter scale acoustic guitar with four strings that I was describing before, yeah. playing the same guitar through the same amp that I was. And it was just like this crazy... Uh, and it's Baloo and Barlow, and we... <laughs> <laughs> We've since become friends, but we didn't really con uh, connect back in at that time, uh -huh. but now we are in each other's orbits. But um, So that was really inspiring. Um, you know, there was the, the Boston was big enough to have touring acts. I remember when the Fall came sure. to play yeah. um, in Boston. That was I fell asleep at that show. That was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was enveloped. Um, and then in New York, you know, I didn't spend as much time in the city as I, you know, could have. Uh, so really, it was like I was on a college campus in the middle of the woods. Uh -huh. I didn't, you know. I, th I think I was my biggest influence at that point, <laughs> you know, like, but I remember going down to, we played CBGB's, that was oh, twice, wow. right me on. and my band, and Hilly Crystal told me he liked my band, oh, so. There you go. That is a real, like, a prize <laughs> memory. Exactly, exactly. Being, being in New York in the 80s, so I guess CBGB's was an influence. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. It sounds like all these musical projects were, um music for art's sake like at, at what point did it did it well i mean at what point were you like did you want to become a rock star oh yeah i think from the very beginning actually i just remembered an, an influence from new york okay. they might be giants oh yeah of course yeah i remember going out and getting that record and playing it in our apartment i lived with you know on, on campus me and my band lived together like the monkeys <laughs> and put on that and went oh my god i just felt so um, uh, kindred uh, to their wacky perspective. I, it made me feel like I wasn't alone, you yeah. know, like, ah, there's another. And they were doing it so well. Anyway, so that was a New York influence. Yeah. Yeah, rock star, I think from, I mean, I have pictures of me with my hair all like, I took my mom's hairspray and tried to make like a crazy flock of seagulls mohawk. Sure. When I was maybe... 11 something like that and i'm playing a tennis racket uh -huh. sunglasses on so i think yeah around 11 or 12 is when i started thinking you know i i don't i don't think i want to be a concert pianist i think i want to rock out yeah oh yeah and, and then but you know interestingly like even from an early age i could there's this dynamic that started early which was a diy kind of idea like don't wait for permission to do what you want to do do it yourself that's where playing, like in Boston, I busked on the street and in the subway. And in New York, I did that too. Um, just, you know, I'm not going to wait around to get a show. I'm just going to go make a show. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's funny because like this desire to be sort of a rock star was immediately tempered with like uh, this feeling of wanting to be small and you know, my sphere of influence, like acknowledging that my sphere of influence is very small and tight and, and I'm not going to like take over the world. 
part of it was probably protection, like protecting myself from the disappointment. <laughs> yeah. But then deep down secretly in the back of my brain, the, the, there's also a little voice saying, you're going to make it. You're going to be fine because you love what you're doing. And people will assemble around somebody who is loving what they're doing. Yeah. So it was a weird dance. It's like a mental dance where you're like, I desired it, but I'm going to temper it with reality. But I think it's going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> When you're when you were busking in Boston and New York, first off, busking in those areas are is pretty tough. There's a lot of uh, competition for the good spots. But yeah. were, were you playing songs that you had made up, or were you playing songs? I mean, were you playing Johnny Cash? What were you like? You're gonna get more tips if you're playing stuff people recognize. Like, yeah, no, I was I was absolutely playing originals okay. uh, <laughs> because it felt like a really great. Um, sort of uh, testing ground for songs because people are busy, they're on their way elsewhere. And if they stop, and even if they give you money, then I would make a note like, all right, this song is working. That's, yeah. that's that dynamic is, is connecting. So I really used it as a uh, proven ground for songwriting. I did a couple covers. I used to cover You Be Illin by Run DMC. <laughs> <laughs> I was so, my buddy uh, that I grew up with, Dave Thiele, and I were so into Raisin Hell when it came out. I mean, we just memorized that entire record. So, um, yeah. And then when, when I first got to Boston, somebody... Uh, I asked somebody, like, well, where, where's the good, you know, I don't know which subway platform is going to be, like, optimal for music. And they're like, oh, you want the outbound orange line. Uh -huh. so went down to the outbound orange line. Turns out the outbound orange line goes out to Dorchester, Jamaica Plain. It's a lot of people of color. Sure. And I'm standing there, this little skinny, bald, white kid playing Run DMC covers on a Sears guitar. <laughs> <laughs> the, the kind of guitar that the case was the amplifier. Yeah, yeah of course. Yeah. I got I got it for 25 bucks in upstate New York at a Goodwill. Right and, on. Yeah. Love that guitar. Anyway, so I think and I actually did okay. I think it's because... The people on the platform are like, this guy's insane. You know, <laughs> you know he, he's obviously, uh, you know, lost. So well, let's give him some money so he can get where he needs to go. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so now what brought you back to Seattle and how did you guys start the, the presidents? I was living in Boston for, I was kind of back and forth between Seattle and Boston. I would come home in the winters to Seattle. I was a house painter in Boston. So, you know, when the weather was good, I'd go there. I, you know, the early, early nineties are real hazy for me when I try to reconstruct my movement. <laughs> yeah. I like Seattle, Boston, Seattle, Boston. And then one morning I woke up in Boston and it was like winter and I was miserable and I had a rash on my face and I was eating bad and I was sick and I was just like, what am I doing here? I'm from Seattle. I need to go home. And <laughs> so I, I bought a friend's van and took a long drive home and, um, and I just felt so good when I arrived back in Seattle and I had forgotten mm -hmm. how, you know, like familiar and lush and beautiful and rugged and cosmopolitan Seattle is. And I just felt this rush of joy and really bottled that joy into songs and immediately connected with Dave Dieterer, who I had played with in high school. And he agreed to play a three string, which was great because he's a really great guitar player and, um, <clears throat> You know, on a six string, and so he was generous enough to 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 um, hog tie himself and be a three stringer. Uh -huh. We did a few shows as a duo, and then Jason Finn saw us w with my other old buddy Dave Thiele, the guy that I grew up with, um, saw us playing together, and just insisted that he was going to be our drummer. And so the presidents were formed. And a lot of the songs, some of the songs on the presidents were around when I was busking in Boston. And um, so, you know, it was a, it, that body of work took a while to kind of coalesce and come together. It was a kind of lifetime's worth of trial and error. And sure. so it was really great. But we, I, we, I felt like this version, I'd had, you know, bands off and on, but this version of uh, 
the band that became the presidents with Dave and Jason, they're such great musicians that it just was like, Oh, there we go. Now I can actually dig in and invest in this because we're not just a college band or, you know, not just playing at a school open mic. (laughs) (laughs) So, um, yeah. So that's kind of how it came together. Jason definitely was the missing puzzle piece and, uh, got us to where we wanted to go. Yeah. And, and how did you guys develop record interest and how'd you get signed? We just didn't try. Um, <laughs> we really, like one of the things I'm most proud of is that, especially in this day and age where you hear about Spotify inventing bands that are algorithms that are designed to, you know, connect with people or whatever. Um, the other end of the spectrum is being a human, doing what makes you really feel good despite how it may reverberate in the world sure and that's what we did we did this because it made us laugh and made us feel good we had this very solid rule in the band where if we any one of us looked down at the set list and could identify a song that they were not excited to play we'd get rid of it wow so the idea was we want to look down at the set list and be excited to play every single song and that's what we kind of, I mean, cause if we were going to do it, we wanted to have fun and sure. feel good first of all. And then number two, be in service to the audience and we present the songs that we were most excited about to them. Uh-huh. So yeah, it was just, we just did that. Okay. And then without, without us even knowing, we played a show during a time when there was a big music festival in Seattle and a whole bunch of industry people were in town they had somehow received the buzz that we were playing and they all packed this club and we just did our nor I had no idea that the audience was full of industry folks just did our normal fun wackadoo set and then the next day we had seven major label offers wow yeah so it was really literally like you know put on your big boy pants cuz here we go yeah <laughs> Uh, so it, and it was it was uh, it was tricky. It was a little tricky because the band really existed because we were relaxed and hanging out with our friends and living in our hometown. And then the success meant leaving hometown, leaving our friends, leaving our families, yeah. being disoriented, going all over the world. And again, a double-edged sword. Like very exciting, very validating, but also like un- feeling unsustainable. Very much the opposite of DIY. Yeah, you know out of my sphere of influence doesn't reach as far as the experiences reaching, you know? So yeah, uh, just, I kind of immediately wanted to break up. I kind of, I I don't know. I, I seem to remember trying to sell the guys on it or sell the label on it actually. But, um, I was like, why don't we pull a sex pistols and just, Break up, <laughs> one album, and we're perfect forever, and that's it. You know, <laughs> but uh, when you're when you're as I like to say, when you're riding a pony that's shitting gold bricks, you hold on for dear life and ride. <laughs> it again. So that's what we did. Um, two two things. Um, yeah. How did you navigate the like which which label to go with? I mean, did you have an attorney? How did you how did you did you have an attorney? And then was there any pushback on the name? Oh, yeah. So we had a manager, I think just right, I can't remember the chronology, but I think right before that show, we hired this uh, manager named Stacy Slater. Um, she was the only candidate. So we're like, sure, you want to manage us? Fine. Yeah. <laughs> Go get some hot dogs for the barbecue. Um, <laughs> so once we got all this interest, then we really had to knuckle down and find a lawyer. Yeah. So we interviewed a lot of lawyers. Um, we ended up with this guy, David Cotico, who, uh, he and his partner, Rosemary Carroll represented all kinds of, you know, like Patty Smith and I believe they represented Nirvana. Okay. Uh, the, uh, you know, it, uh, well, through Patty Smith, the MC5 estate was sure. managed anyway, which would become relevant later. But, um, yeah, we had, uh, a lot of analysis to do. I think we had... I wanted, yeah, we had seven labels. We really pretty quickly got it down to two. We got it down to Maverick, which was Madonna's label. Okay. And uh, Columbia, as, you know, part of Sony. Sure. 
Uh, and so we kind of then had multiple meetings with both of those entities. And um, in the end, the, the guy running Madonna's label, Freddie DeMann, was nervous about the fact that we had um, started the process of making uh, some seven-inch singles with a couple of local Seattle labels. Uh -huh. And, it, and he, he was threatened by that. He thought, like, that was going to take away from album sales or something. And we're like, this guy doesn't get it. Yeah. Um, Madonna got it. She totally got it. We had an amazing meeting with her. She gave, gave me some really great advice as a songwriter. She said, if you have success, one thing you should do is not expect critical acclaim for what you do for your craft because the songs are fun. And nobody will ever give you any sort of respect for the craft of assembling music that is fun and light, you know. Yeah. So that was that turned out to be true. Yeah. Uh, so that's cool. But anyway, in the end, the guy running the label, not understanding the relative power of these little dinky singles, uh, got in the way. Columbia was like, "Fine, we don't care. Go ahead, put them out." <laughs> So we did, and uh, yeah, we ended up signing with Columbia, and it was great because while we were meeting with Madonna, her assistant, Guy O'Siri, played us a cassette of their newest artist they just signed, and uh, it was Alanis Morissette. Oh, wow. We, you know, but we had no idea at the time she was going to be huge. Yeah. Could be like, hey, here's this new artist, uh, Spaceman Monkey. <laughs> uh, you know, we don't know. But it ended up being great that we went with Columbia because obviously the headline with Maverick was, you know, female, um, uh, female led label signs, strong female artist. And it's all that story. Yeah. Yeah. Wouldn't have really fit in that story. And I think as it was with Columbia, we, we kind of were kings of the, of the roost and we kind of saved their bottom line for a year and a half or two. So we were well, uh, taken, taken care of until they stole money from us, which what? we found out. Oh, yeah. A record label did that? Yeah, yeah. It was the first time. <laughs> <laughs> well, how, uh, can you, can you uh, describe that in a little more detail? How <laughs> they stole your, stole your money? Oh, yeah. They were just, you know, stealing record royalties for, for years. We didn't audit them until, gosh, I don't remember the year. might have been after we broke up for the first time in 99 uh -huh. or 98. Um, early 98 was our last show for the first arc of the band uh -huh. uh, I think we audited them then and yeah they, they stole over a million dollars from us we settled for about a quarter of that and uh, and how much did you have to pay the attorney that did the audit boy I don't remember I think it, it ended up it ended up being sort of symbolic mm -hmm. you know uh, we yeah, generally I don't want to engage in that kind of thing like there's a song on uh, Millennium Tension by uh, Tricky where he totally quotes one of my songs, Naked and Famous, from our debut. Yeah. I was like, um, I could sue Tricky, but, you know, yeah. I'm not going to do it. So I just figured, like, well, that means I can sample a Tricky song, and then we're, we're even. <laughs> <laughs> when your version of uh, Cleveland Rocks, or not, of England Rocks, got picked for Drew Carey, did you see a lot of money from that, or or was the, yeah. did you make a lot of money for um, <laughs> for something? Yeah, it else? was good. Okay, no, it was it was good. Um, you know, obviously Ian Hunter wrote that song, yeah. so Ian Hunter did really well. Yeah, um, and yeah, we did well, and it was really the moment where my eyes were open to that world of uh, composing for shows, um, you know, licensing music, and I ended up creating like a seven hundred piece library over the next 10 years that I licensed through a company called Pump Audio in New, out of New York. Uh -huh. um, and that was a great bread and butter uh, way to stay home and make music and make money, uh -huh. make a living. Yeah. So yeah, that was great. And that was all because Drew Carey was on the Rosie O'Donnell show with us and he came to our trailer and he had a supermodel on each arm, of course. <laughs> <laughs> there he is. Um, and we hung out for a while, and we got along really well. And he's like, I want you guys to do the theme song for my show. And so we, we did. Wow, and right at, the very end of, at the very end of the song, you can hear, oh, hi, oh, oh yeah, hi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's Drew. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he, he phoned it in into the studio where we were working. So, yeah. 
and and you guys were pretty much part of i mean you guys rode the wave of mtv right before it it, it yeah it crashed and burned right that, before it became mediocre television <laughs> exactly how but what what was it what, what was it like um i mean you guys were you were in every household i know it was it was phenomenal i was uh present when mtv flicked on me and my friend dale again the guy that i played music within high school we knew when it was coming on i think it was august 1st 1980 uh 1980 i believe yeah maybe 81 i can't remember but anyway we he yeah. it was 80 i think yeah. yeah his family had one of those uh prototype like very early projection televisions sure. it was like a big console and a big screen so we i mean it was like watching on a movie screen we would end up, of course, in the years to come, spending countless hours in that basement waiting for, like, Shark Attack by Split Ends or something good to come on. Yep. Um, but, yeah, we were there. It flicked on. Video Killed the Radio Star was the first song. And we ended up, presidents ended up kind of making that song our own. It was in The Wedding Singer with Adam Sandler. Okay. And we covered it every show. It was, you know, we kind of hijacked that song. But, um yeah, so to then, you know, not too many years later, 13, 14 years on TV, when it mattered, yeah. was an uh, incredible rush. I mean, uh, equal only to the rush of Weird Al playing me in a video. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I've got some good. I've got some good mile markers, you know, like Hilly Crystal telling me he liked my band, being on MTV, having Weird Al play me in a video. I'm like, what? <laughs> Every so often when I do interviews like this, and I start tallying up these little, these little cultural moments I've had, I'm like, shit. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty amazing. <laughs> I know it's weird. <laughs> and and is, you like you mentioned the the presidents had their first like you broke up at the first point in '98, and yeah. then what brought the band back together? And you can say money. <laughs> no, it wasn't money at all. Okay. It was Chris Novoselic from Nirvana. He needed well, so we had we'd been broken up for five years. We actually made a record while we were broken up, called "Freaked Out and Small," for a just a one-off thing, no touring, no oh. playing live, just did it. And then we had a band with Sir Mix a Lot called Subset. So we did stuff in that five years, but not as the presidents playing, you know, the hits, we sure. were making new stuff. But, and then we'd had a couple of offers to get back together, but it always felt like, no, 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 I think it's done. But then Chris Novoselic came along and needed a band to uh, kind of play with him at a ceremony for the NARIS, the National Academy of Recording Arts and Sciences, was having some sort of, um, I don't know, it was like an, uh, very limited scope award show uh and chris was getting an award for his political um involvement involvement in politics and stuff i think is how i remember it anyway they wanted him to perform nirvana was obviously over so he asked us to be his band we did a we did a bo diddley cover we did a sex pistols cover we did one of chris's songs i can't remember what the fourth song was but um it was really fun. Yeah. Oh, it was. I think we did a president song. Okay. Uh, which is why at the end we were kind of like, that felt good, yeah. you know. Uh, and Chris would later he's sat in with us like half a dozen times. Okay. But he's a little bit. He and Duff McKagan from uh, Guns N' Roses. Sure. They're sort of the fourth presidents. They share a. For, well, and then Dave Feely from my childhood. So there's the fourth <laughs> president slot has three people in it. Okay. Cool. <laughs> The, and when, yeah. when you did that show, so you mentioned that you played those other songs, were you using a traditional bass or were you still playing the, the two-string? No, it's still playing the two-string, right, for sure. Right on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that was really fun. And that's when we first looked at each other and went, yes, this is possible. And so we got together and rehearsed a little bit. We put out a feeler. We did a reunion show uh, at the Crocodile, which was one of our home base clubs in seattle back in the day sure and and the, after that show we were like yes let's let's do it so and then dave our guitar player only lasted about another year uh and we made a record during that time and then he had to go for family reasons so we got this guy andrew mckaig to join uh -huh. another great guitar player who was willing to play a three string yeah uh, and uh yeah so that we had another 13 years 
uh, of the second arc. And then in 2015, we sort of quietly turned off the lights. Uh-huh. And have you yeah. done any shows since 2015 or no? <clears throat> Not presidents, no. Yeah. no. Okay. All right. It, it's, it's in the history books. Yeah. I'm... I, you know, you talked about knees. Yes. <laughs> I'd be courting disaster if I did it now. You know, <laughs> I just, I just, you know, I, I want to respect what we achieved. Sure, and sure. The energy level that we had was because we were younger people, and you know, yeah. I like what was that Woody Allen thing? It's like uh, uh, relation, relationships are like sharks; they have to constantly be moving. And what we have here is a dead shark. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> so you you created this music library. Was that is what 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 period of time was that? That was kind of late nineties into like two thousand four or five, something like that. I just spent all my time in the studio making these things. And the company so the guy that signed us to Columbia, Josh Sarabin, uh-huh. he and a, his friend Steve uh created this thing called Pump Audio and they were you know, trying to get music into the hands of music supervisors. You know, reality TV was becoming oh, yeah. a thing. It was like all these music cues in the shows. And so that's where my music went is into all this stuff. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it, it was like six or seven years there where I was focusing on making that. And then it kind of did its own thing for another bunch of years. But now that that field is super crowded, yeah. pump bought by Getty. Um, and Getty, the terms, the terms as far as uh, percentage do the artist got worse and worse and worse and worse and worse, and then I just shut it down because yeah. it wasn't, it wasn't doing anything. So, yeah. So now let's talk about Casper Baby Pants. How did that yes. come about? That came about from during that time when the presidents were a big deal. Um, I was hearing a voice in my gut or whatever, kind of a message from the universe saying, congratulations on what you've achieved, but you're not done. This is not your final stop. You got to keep going. There's another pallet waiting for you that, you know, you need to figure out. So I, but I, that's all I had. I just had this gut feeling. So I started experimenting on this side with other bands and other sounds. And uh, I actually had a band with Mick, one of mix a lot's protégés for a while. And I, put together a trio that played kind of pop music and three songwriters. I was trying all this different stuff. Sure. And eventually, it went, none of it was clicking or feeling right, but eventually I met my second wife, Kate, and she makes uh, art for families, for children. She does she illustrates and writes children's books, and I looked at her art and went, oh, that's it. I want to make music that comes from the same planet as that art. Yeah. I tried making some songs that felt like they were in the same wheelhouse and realized it's music for little kids. And specifically zero to five, zero to six. I didn't want to get into like, you know, dinosaurs and anything cool. No cool shit. No instructional shit. Here's how you brush your teeth, blah, blah, blah. Here's how you count to ten. I just wanted to make bizarre, surreal, fun yeah. Multi influ- you know, influences from all kinds of different music for the littles. Yeah. How is so, yes and no not cool? <laughs> yes and no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's great. Um, I know. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's the thing. By not being cool, I turned out, it ended up, I was really cool. Yeah. <laughs> but actually, that, that was a feeling I got when I figured out it was supposed to be kids' music that I was supposed to be doing. I felt this liberation from that culture of cool that grown up world had sort of, uh, you know, uh, kind of um, polluted my joy of songwriting with. Like, I got to the point where I couldn't tell if I, I couldn't just sit and play music. I had to be on my way to writing the next hit or something, you know? Yeah. So anyway, it was nice to, <clears throat> the realization that I was supposed to be making kids music freed me of that whole culture of, you know, winning at alternative radio and all that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. and do you like, do you tour, you know, like uh, nursery schools and stuff like that? No, uh, no, I haven't done, I mean, I did it from 2009 to, I shut it down in like, uh, what was it? It was uh, 20. 21 something okay. like that yeah i did 19 records wow 362 songs wow 12 years 
1,300 shows. Wow. Yeah. It arced. It did its arc. Yeah. And uh, I just ran out of things to say after, the, after 19 albums. <laughs> so, so what are you doing musically now? Now I'm doing stuff I call pop cosmic. It's like pop songwriting sensibilities, but also stretched out and kind of jammy and distorted and funky and trancy. And lyrically, it's all about big ideas like being alive, uh, eventually dying, mm -hmm. uh, being made of molecules, just like everything else, kind of spiritual. I'm goofing around with like spiritual um, ideas and making them fun to listen to. And it is really fun. I've got eight records. Or I've got my, what is it? I've got my, what, what number am I on? Oh, I've got my eighth record coming out in January. Wow. I'm doing two a year, January and July. Uh, <laughs> my eighth one's coming out, and it's a whole series. It's a whole arc unto itself. Um, and it's really fun because I am going back and listening to some of the old fragments, all the music I made for TV shows and stuff like that, and finding little bits that fit this new style. And um, for instance, I'm, I'm finishing some songs I wrote in the 80s. Oh, wow. uh, so it's really fun to kind of collaborate with my younger self in a way. Uh, and yeah, I just really love it. It's not, you know, it's a hobby at this point. The analogy I use is I'm like a guy who has a nine to five job and on the weekends I go into my workshop and I make beautiful chairs. <laughs> nobody's, nobody's buying these chairs. Nobody wants these chairs, but I'm just making great chairs. Yeah. So my motto is nobody cares. I'm just making chairs. <laughs> <laughs> and are you are, financially, are you set like um, from President's yeah. money? Okay. Yeah, the President's and Casper. Wow. Oh, Casper. Really? just keeps on going. I do nothing. Uh, my dream is and always has been to not spend money on promotion, to just make the music as great as I can make it and as useful for the purpose I'm making it for yeah. as it can be. And then happy people will tell happy, you know, other people to listen to it. And so the, the heard it through the grapevine parent recommendation network. Yeah. In keeping Casper alive, and uh, <laughs> it just goes and goes and goes. Every five years, that fan base grows out of it, and a new fan base grows in, and they all they stream. Keep making babies. Yeah, keep <laughs> making babies. Yeah, and when those babies grow up, they'll buy yeah, the whole exactly. again for their kids, and then they'll discover the presidents. And yeah, yeah. Between the presidents and Casper, um, I'm able to just be a hobbyist and enjoy myself and make chairs. So, yeah, make chairs. <laughs> and some people do care, it turns out. I, after eight records, I actually am connecting with some people. I care. So. Oh, do you? <laughs> yes. You can listen to it a little bit? Okay. Uh, yeah, I care for yeah. sure. So behind you, I see I see four guitars. I see yeah. it looks like a ES-295, but I don't know. It, maybe not. This guy? Yeah. That? Uh, you know, I don't, I don't remember the... Um, the oh, it's uh, not a 295 at all. No, it's a it's a it's a Harmony Hollywood. Oh, okay. Set up as a three string. This is uh, this guitar's name is Butterscotch. Okay. And Butterscotch was my Casper guitar. So okay. Butterscotch and I have done thirteen hundred shows together. Wow. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing. It's got a fader yeah, it between does. the two pickups. Yeah. So you can really kind of dial in uh, the exact kind of vibe. Where you want it, yeah. It's got semi-wound strings on it. Yeah. So it's not too... Chimey. Big, not too pingy, you yeah. know, and noisy. Um, and then I used to play it through an Ampeg uh, 115, or uh, no, 110 15-watt amp. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, so this guy, boy, I mean girl, sorry. Butterscotch, you a guy or a girl? I can't remember. <laughs> I used to do a whole thing where Butterscotch would talk and, uh, with the kids. And this guitar is a Kauai. I don't know the model number either, but I got it at a pawn shop in Boston. Right on. For 75 bucks, and this is the guitar that's on the President's debut album. Okay. So it looks like it's in good shape. It's in good shape. I use it. I still use it for the music I'm making now. For a guy that jumped uh, around a lot. Um. Yeah. Well, I, I stopped. I didn't tour with this guitar. Okay. I had a deal with Epiphone. So Epiphone provided me with uh, like an SG. 300. Stop. Yeah. 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 And I would convert those to a two-string. Okay. 
But yeah, I love this guitar so much. Uh, you know, seventy-five dollar investment sold five million records with yeah. it. So right it's on. Pretty good. <laughs> Do you know the gauges that you were using uh, as far as strings? Yeah, sixty and thirty-six. Okay. It was tuned C sharp, G sharp. Okay. Yeah. Right. And then, but the, I think with butterscotch, it was what was it, fifty-two, forty-two, thirty? I think. Okay. With, for the three string every guitar is a little different because of the scale yeah yeah of course so kind of it, it would float around and this is you know up close this is the guitar that uh mark had set up as a two string yep revolutionized everything for me I, it, got, no, strangely it has six strings on it yeah well yeah I, <laughs> I'm, I'm back to playing everything now i play six string i have a oh, i have a four string bass three string two string yeah, so I'm because I'm kind of resurrecting old songs as part of what I'm doing, and okay. a lot of it's recorded with six string. So this guitar is great. This so when I lived in Boston, I was helping a friend move, uh -huh. and he pointed to a closed guitar case and said, "Do you want this guitar?" Didn't even see the guitar. Took it. Yeah, I said yes. Yeah. Took it home, opened it up, and it was this. It was a a, a Harmony Broadway. Yeah. Um, and I recorded so many songs, wrote songs that would become president songs on this guitar. Lost it. Have no idea what happened to it. About five years ago, I was in my favorite records or uh, guitar store, Thunder Road Record, uh, Thunder Road Guitars here uh -huh. in Seattle. Okay. And this was on the wall. I pulled it down. Just played like two chords and went. That's it. I'll take it. And I. Don't think it is the exact guitar that I had, but I like to pretend it is. Yeah, of course, of course. After what would it be like twenty-five years that guitar found me? Yeah. So, anyway, that's the story with that dude. And then this guy is a little Harmony Harmony Stratotone. Yes. That uh, this is the guitar I played when I played with Beck. Okay. And. That whole bow, 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 that thing yeah. I'm losing. It wasn't record. This isn't the guitar that the recording was made out of. But when I played live, um, this was the guitar that I played wow. with back. Right on. It was painted spray painted gold at the time, but I took the paint off. Uh, the spray paint off. Wow, you did a good job. <laughs> Uh, well, you can't really see all the the scratches that I did. I didn't really do the greatest job. My son is a guitar builder and repairer and player, okay. and he he really should have been the one to take the paint off. <laughs> Done a better job. Does he does that, he work at a particular shop or does he as he all by himself? He's freelance. He lives up in Bellingham, Washington, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, Augie Baloo, okay. and he he's a really talented. I'm wait. I uh, actually ordered. A, a customized uh, slash replica of George Harrison's um, Telly yeah, from the Rosewood get, Telly. Yeah, the Rosewood Telly. So yeah. he's building me a Rosewood Telly, but he lost his shop, and so it's taken a while. But you know, eventually. Yeah. <laughs> and the, as you mentioned, the Ampeg amp. Is there are there other amps that you're, you? I saw you with uh, it looked like a custom tuck and roll, but gold. Yeah, I used to play an it was an, uh, an acoustic head, acoustic bass head, mm -hmm. um, through a tuck and roll uh, custom cabinet, and then I went to a Music Man. What was this? I can't remember the model number on it. It was a sort of uh, solid state and tube. Yeah, a Music Man head. Yep, that that was on, their, that was their thing. Yeah, yeah, and that was great. That was cool. I never used well, in the early days. I used a, a rat pedal occasionally, uh -huh. uh, but then it was so. Con I, I, I'm a minimalist, and I just couldn't handle the pedal flying around the stage. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. so um, I, I like that Music Man amp because I could set it with the Gibson with a um, P90, and I think they had P90s in them. Uh, I could set it so that if I played quiet, it was clean, and if I dug in, it would be distorted. Yeah, yeah. So I could kind of control that with how I played rather than hitting a pedal on the stage. I let Dave deal with all the pedals and yeah. all that stuff. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, and I think that's kind of it. The only other, I mean, the only other old guitar I've got is this. It's a silver tone, uh -huh. silver tone acoustic. I put a pickup. Believe it or not. 
This pickup, Lawrence, it's the cheapest Lawrence pickup there is. I think it's an A300 or something. Uh -huh. It is the greatest pickup because it translates whatever's characteristic, uh, whatever characteristic the guitar has, if it's tinny, if it's boomy, if it's mid-rangey, this pickup takes whatever that is. It's transparent. It just amplifies right whatever it yeah. has. And they're so cheap. I don't even know if you, they make them anymore. I got these at like a really weird little music store that sells, you know, that rented trumpets to kids yeah. who were playing in a school band. But I've never been happier with an acoustic pickup. It's right. really incredible. <laughs> and then last but not least, of course, is the, the only uh, Epiphone instrument that I ended up keeping from my time getting an endorsement with them uh this paul mccartney-esque uh yeah. bass. my son augie did all this augie had this bass for about six years and then i got it back so <laughs> put these weird um i don't know what they are <laughs> yeah. images on it but th it's a great bass it, it's that classic kind of flat uh, boomy woofy yeah. sound Yep. Yep. So that's kind of the that's the tour. I, that's all I own at this point. I used to have like thirty guitars, but I've got it down to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And when you sold them, where'd you sell? Oh, I used to sell them at a place called uh, Emerald City Guitars of here course. in Seattle. Yep, Trevor. And I've, I've consigned a few at uh, Thunder Road in West Seattle, but yeah, Jay at um, at Emerald City was a okay. real great guy to know he, you know he'd let me trade let me take stuff home and try it and you know yeah he was he was real helpful back in the day when i was shuffling guitars all over the place <laughs> yep yep <clears throat> well i don't want to take too much more of your time you've spent a lot of time with me and i really appreciate it and uh sure thing. I, I mean i could ask you a million more questions about touring and and you know in the 90s and stuff any particular you know any any crazy story touring in the 90s Oh boy, we were so responsible, you know, like th we don't have a lot of crazy touring stories because when we were faced with going on tour, we sat down and we're like, all right, we are going to do this and we are going to come home with money. <laughs> you know, everyone around us was spending all their money on like buses and, you know, food and taking a chef along and yes. They'd come home and be like, we don't have any money. We did two bus tours and then got the bill and we're like, nope. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we ended up downsizing to like sprinter vans. And, uh, you know, we were just heads down. We were workers on tour, man. Um, I mean, you know, the main headline from being on tour is just the thrill of like, say, going to Europe and stepping out on a stage at like Roskilde or Pink Pop and seeing... 50,000 people, you know, yeah. like, especially when you're the first band on <laughs> the day, but they've made the effort to come. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, so that really the big story from touring was just the thrill of it all. Um, you know, I'll probably hang up and remember five stories that I am not <laughs> right now. But we, we didn't get up to, you know, we had sort of jobs, right? Like I was creative, the creative part. Dave Dieterer was the, um, business guy. He could read a contract. Jason was late night PR. He'd go out and get drunk with all the, you know, make make people, make the suits feel special and sure. that kind of thing. So, being the creative guy uh, and, you know, expending the energy I was expending singing, I had to go to sleep after yep. a show. Sure. You know? yep. I, I totally so, understand. Yeah. I mean, but, you know, one highlight was playing on the same stage that the Beatles played on in Melbourne, Australia. Wow. Just kind of feel vibe, you know. We were, we were kind of, uh, yeah, like Australia was pretty storied. I mean, we had to run for cars. You know, there was like a, you know, a, a kind of a mania about the band. And uh, so that resulted in us needing aliases at hotels. We wow. couldn't use our names. Yeah. This was just in Australia for just a short amount of time, but my alias was Paul McCartney. So I figured, <laughs> <laughs> figured that would throw him off the scent. <laughs> Have you ever been approached by any um, political party to 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 uh, do anything? No. Yeah. No. The closest we got to that was back in the in the what year was it? I think it was in the nineties. We played an election night special for Bill Maher. Okay. Uh, 
And but you know, that was the closest we ever got. Right. Uh, of course, it, you know, it became the name of the band afforded us you know certain promotional opportunities, and you know, people were always decorating our stages with red, white, and blue bunting and stuff like that. Yeah. Like, but the joke was, you know, it's this highest office in the land, and then you look at us, and we're like three dorks playing guitars with two strings, <laughs> and obviously it's, you know, uh, a joke. Yeah. But anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Chris. I am a fan and of, of everything that you're doing, so thank I, you. I appreciate your time. I really appreciate that. Thanks for thanks for uh, listening to me uh, yeah. spout off. For of course, an hour. it's it's wonderful. I love it. <laughs> All right, cool, man. Well, I hope I get well, to see you in person at some point. Yeah, uh, you never know. You never know. I'm kind of not really interested in playing live anymore, but uh, never say never is my big motto. Oh, right on. <laughs> Do a Trump hand. Never say never. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> All right, James. All right, thank you, sir. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks for listening to Have Guitar Will Travel. You can catch up on all the things I'm doing at thedeadlies.com. And I'm on all the social media platforms as well. And please support Vintage Guitar and all the wonderful things they do because they do many, many wonderful things for us guitar players. Thanks. Please subscribe. Please tell a friend. And I'll see you guys next week. Bye, guys.